Hello, everyone. This is Greg Smalley on Pod 366, a Weird Movies podcast. I'm joined today, as I often am, by Giles Edwards. And we have a special guest today, uh, director Richard Bailey, who is known for uh, A Ship of Human Skin. Did I get that right? Yes. King Judith. And a new upcoming feature that we'll talk about later, which is called, I believe, The Dark Sisters, right? That's okay. right. Thank you. Glad I remembered all those. Um, today, we also have a bunch of uh, home video releases to talk about. And we're going to jump right into that because we actually have a number of them to talk about this week. Uh, none of them particularly high priority, but... All right. Can you guys see what I've got on the screen? Uh, yeah. Okay. So I'm almost embarrassed uh, talking about this one. This, <laughs> is, this is called Bat Pussy. Um, and it is it's sort of widely known as the worst pornographic movie ever made. Uh, it was never really released. It was discovered in a, uh, like a, a business closing for an adult movie theater. And uh, unfortunately, I've seen this, I'm embarrassed to say, in my youth, uh, when it came out, something weird video uh, brought this out. It is a parody of Batman. It is featuring some of the ugliest performers you've ever seen. And it's not, you know, being ugly is, you know, but they, they don't, they are not, into the the sexual performance or they're very self-conscious about it and uh it's just horrible but what everybody remembers about it is batwoman here who's played by uh dora dildo uh stage name <laughs> she moves on on this this little toy that we used to have back in the 60s and i even had one in the 70s little bouncing toy uh and that's what the film's known for. And we have a clip of that. Uh, I uh, do not recommend anyone see this movie. <laughs> but it does have a reputation among cult fans as kind of a movie you see on a dare, I think. So uh, I thought I'd have to mention it. Uh, but uh, we'll, that segues into the next movie because uh, Bat Pussy was actually discovered by the man who directed this movie. Uh, Dam Zelvis. Uh, he worked, uh, his name is uh, John Michael McCarthy or JMM. He worked with Something Weird a lot uh, and gave them, found a number of old films for them and then started directing his own films. Uh, this is his first movie. It's very raw. We have a clip up on the website at 366weirdmovies.com that you can see. Very low budget. Uh, McCarthy was sort of obsessed. He's from Memphis and he's sort of obsessed or his aesthetic is built around rockabilly culture from the 50s. And uh, a lot of references to Elvis and uh, pinup girls and early grindhouse movies and exploitation movies and that kind of thing. If I haven't seen this one, it's being released by Vinegar Syndrome. It's kind of a surprise release because I think I think a lot of people thought that this movie was just an entry in his filmography of something that I don't think anybody had ever seen, uh, but it features a, uh, you know, a fake Elvis uh, called Helvis, his daughter, uh, and it's got some mummies and zombies and rockabilly combat in it and uh, very low budget, a lot of solarization, and some cheap effects. So um, did you guys have any comments on this one? Uh, I, I read the description and uh, something that stood out with it was uh, remarking on the unabashed nudity you, you found in 70s and 80s motion pictures. And it occurred to me that that is a trend that kind of died sometime by the early 90s, I want to say. And uh, I guess in a way that that may be unfortunate, depending upon what you're looking for in a motion picture. But uh, other than that, it definitely looked like it ticked a number of boxes to be worth a look for certainly completists and uh, anyone uh, poking around the lesser seen weird 
films that are out there. I do think with the nudity that uh, uh, the internet has, has kind yeah. of nudity no longer is uh, something that's rare. So it used to be you would, you know, when you were a, a young teenager, you'd go look for the racy VHS, you know, so you could get to see some naked women. And now you don't have to do that. So there's not an incentive to add nudity to movies anymore. Yeah, there was a video rental place nearby. It had saloon doors to the adult section, so mm -hmm. they were very minimally blocked. Uh, anyone over, you know, five foot could kind of peek over and see what kind of enticements were lying behind there. Richard, saw... any... yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I saw the the clip that uh, that you shared on the side and was uh, immediately delighted by the DIY aesthetic of it. I was not at all familiar with uh, Dan Selvis, Daughter of Helvis. Uh, so there is testimony to uh, sites like yours, you know, that uh, these these hidden gems are, are hidden no longer. Uh, I really enjoyed the, the clip that I saw. Um, uh, we'll see, you know, how if, 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 the, if the patience and delight, you know, lasts through the, <laughs> the motion picture, but uh, certainly a, an inspiring clip. Yeah, very low budget, very and very. You can see a lot of creativity uh, that's there with not a lot of uh, means. But uh, so yeah, I think that I haven't seen it. I've seen two of his other movies, which were higher budgeted than this one, but still very low budget. Uh, and he is an interesting character for sure. Uh, possible, maybe we could get him on the show sometime. Um, but let's move on. This is more of a also low budget movie, but definitely more accomplished and more of a classic uh, movie that cult movie fans know. It's Blood for Dracula, also known as Andy Warhol's Dracula. Uh, Udo Kier stars as Dracula. And uh, the twist in this one is he can only drink the blood of virgins, uh, but he's in, in the modern world and uh, virginity is a scarce uh, scarce and increasingly grown scarcer uh, concept, uh, especially with Joe D'Alessandro around as the gardener who keeps deflowering all Dracula's victims. Uh, this is a huge, uh, this is a release. This is actually getting a 4K UHD release uh, from Severin, uh, which is you know, kind of shocking to me that a movie this <laughs> this far down would uh, far down the cult ladder would get such a amazing release it's also on includes a standard blu-ray and they're reissuing the soundtrack cd i don't remember the soundtrack as being anything special but it's on there uh so guys uh, any thoughts on blood for dracula uh well i missed out on uh flesh for frankenstein so i actually uh, when i read about this uh from your email i i ordered it so uh, oh. I'll, I'll consider myself on the hook for reviewing this since i have only seen clips of other andy warhol things of the more abstract nature and not so much the uh commercial exploitation genre and uh, udo kier is uh always a pleasure to see on screen so i'm i'm looking forward to this I was looking at the specifications of the Blu-ray and it's just going to look gorgeous. Um, the rendering of this movie that I'd seen before wasn't the best uh, rendering, but even in, in uh, that state, I, I could tell that the movie was really good looking. Um, the uh, theatricality of it is, is very inviting and kudos to Paul Morrissey, um, someone who uh, was certainly within uh, Andy Warhol's factory sphere, but who was not necessarily defined by that sphere. I think movies like this, he was successful um, in his own right, you know, to uh, to bring about uh, his own sensibilities into a motion picture so that we can talk about this movie without at the same time having to talk about uh, via a uh, far reaching dissertation uh, dis discussing uh, the aesthetics of, or the the, the kitsch value of, of of Warhol, you know, and all of that. You can. It's a testament to Morrissey that you can talk about him uh, as a singular entity, as a, as a filmmaker, uh, without having to bring in. Uh, although he was certainly uh, appreciative of uh, everything that that Warhol, you know, did for him, and uh, that everything that uh, that he learned from his time in the factory. Uh, it's interesting. You can tell in movies like this that he's definitely his own person, his own filmmaker. And uh, it's I, I look forward to seeing this this release of it, the UHD. I, I think it's going to look fantastic and it's a fun movie to watch. Yeah, and there was actually I'm reminded uh, with the name Paul Morrissey at Fantasia a few years ago. I think the last one before the 
pandemic shut it down for a couple of years, there was a four short film anthology kind of thing called Letters to Paul Morrissey, which had uh, various um, sort of fans of Morrissey's work react to uh, his legacy uh, in their particular storytelling. So that was a very interesting snapshot at uh, not necessarily Morrissey's work, but work he inspired. Yeah, and I'm glad you both brought brought up Morrissey because uh, my uh, sort of sense on this is is Andy Warhol just kind of slapped his names on these movies. They, it was originally released as Andy Warhol's Dracula, but Paul Morrissey had complete uh, creative control. It is a Paul Morrissey movie. Uh, Andy Warhol certainly kind of uh, uh, nurtured him and mentored him and put up the mo money, most importantly. Uh, but nowadays, uh, they they are not called Andy Warhol's Dracula and Andy Warhol's Frankenstein anymore. They go with Blood for Dracula and Flesh for Frankenstein, which gives Paul Morrissey more of his of the credit he's due. So, okay, let's move on. This one, uh, hopefully people have seen this one recently since it's so new, uh, Crimes of the Future, David could be David Cronenberg's last movie, uh, <clears throat> certainly sort of a culmination of themes uh, that uh, he's been interested in. Uh, a lot of it deals with, uh, you know, sort of a, a surgery in the future as performance art and people watching uh, bodies be hacked up and in the future people are growing spontaneously growing these new organs that have never been seen before and there's a real sense of you know sort of uh, nature gone awry and uh, and uh, human morals uh, following um, so uh, I think a lot of people have already seen this one it's uh, definitely recommended definitely for Cronenberg fans um, guys any comments on uh, I'll admit I haven't seen it yet, uh, but it is a matter of time uh, for me to do so. I'm glad to hear you say that it's a uh, return to form for him because there was a stretch, certainly by the mid-90s, that he seemed to veer from the path I would have preferred him to stay on with a number of, uh, shall we say, more straightforward dramatic films as opposed to the uh, if not uh, body horror, then body commentary that he had been perfecting in the preceding years. Uh, so, uh, I, I, uh, I, I'm looking forward to checking this out when time permits. Okay. I think it's a great film, uh, just a truly great film. Every tableau is one that you could just <laughs> meditate on and uh, uh, allow strange dreams, you know, to enter. Um, there was. Uh, talk in the beginning of when I remember when just before this was released or just before it came up in Cannes um, folks wondering where how to discuss it in terms of Cronenberg's of career um, for me it's it's one of his major films not a late film you know not a a, a return to, to ne not necessarily just a return to uh, previous themes but but on its own you know it's, it's a major film um, in his uh, body of work and also, I was very curious, uh, before I'd seen it, I was reading that this was the first time in a very long time, he wasn't working with his regular cinematographer, Peter Krzyzewski, um, who'd been with him since Dead Ringers back in 1988. And folks may say, well, let's you know, one person in, a, in a, a, an entire film crew that, that's absent. But uh, with a DP, you know, a, a cinematographer, that's, a, that's the head of a department, which comes with a variety of technicians all of whom are invested in, in the look of your movie, you know, and, and the tone of it. So that sort of switch is a, is a pretty major switch uh, for someone, especially after such a long period of time of, of, uh, of, of making movies with, uh, with Krzyzewski, but now to move to uh, Douglas Koch, who is <laughs> just, just masterful. I think they do uh, make a wonderful film. And it's a reminder too, uh, Criterion is playing uh, the film that has that original name, Crimes of the Future, that Cronenberg made in uh, 1970, back when he was uh, operating the camera himself and editing himself. And I think the reason, one of the reasons that uh, Cronenberg can make a great movies like, like this, even with a switch at a, at a major, major department head, such as the DP, is that uh, looking at that older film, the, the first Crimes of the Future, very different thematically in, in the way that it's, it's put together, but his sense of framing, 
uh, his sense of, of of pacing, you know, it was all quite there at the beginning, you know. So uh, he's always uh, had a, a very strong uh, resource or has had recourse to a visual language seemingly throughout his career. And he certainly draws on it here. Um, I can only gush at this point about this movie. I everyone will watch it and, and have a good time with it. All right. Well, I'm glad you like it so much. Um, yeah, I think it's it's up there with it's up there with his better movies. Yeah. Um, let's move on because uh, people will want to check this this out if you haven't already. But this one just came in at the kind of last minute. It's not really a, a weird movie collection so much because um, a lot of Lucas Moodyson's work is uh, in the uh, realistic drama uh, category, even though they often contain some strong uh, and bravely addressed sexual themes, as you can tell from the title of his debut uh, fucking Amal, which had a different title in uh, the United States. The other titles are Together, Lilia Forever, which I believe is about sex trafficking, A Hole in My Heart, Container, Mammoth, and We Are the Best, which is actually pretty much a family-friendly movie uh, from him. The two movies that are kind of weird in here, that neither of which I have seen, uh, but I'm going by reputation, are A Hole in My Heart, and Container, Container particularly being definitely his attempt to do a completely surreal avant-garde movie. Um, and I have to say also that among looking at IMDb, the IMDb ratings, the, the two weird films definitely get by far the lowest ratings of any of his, his movies. Um, I have only seen We Are the Best from Lucas Moodyson. Uh, generally, it's not his movies have not been the kind of thing that uh, have interested me. I'd never heard of A Hole in My Heart and Container before. Uh, so I just wanted to bring this one up and mention it and see if you guys had any comments on it. I had seen Lilia Forever. Uh, that's a harrowing film. Um, very good art house film, uh, coming of age story, uh, sort of, sort of a, a documentary style. Uh, I hear it's very different uh, from from the weird films that you mentioned. I'm kind of curious as to why that switch that Lilia Forever seemed to do all right with him with having a U.S. release um, and uh, a worldwide release and, and you know, theatrical wise. Um, but something changed. They moved into a different territory. And uh, I'd, I'd be very curious to, to see what that territory is. As far as IMDb, yeah, the weird movies are always going to <laughs> uh, draw lower for for whatever reason. You just sort of you know, you, you, according to IMDb, you know, Abel Ferrer has never made a good movie. <laughs> so, and, and probably also, you know, Lucas Moodyson fans weren't expecting those those movies from him because he didn't start that way. You know, he, he did three or four uh, big films in a different style, and then he switches in the middle, and he kind of maybe lost his fan base. That might explain some of the low ratings. Uh, otherwise, I mean, they're all they all should be good films uh, or at least interesting ones. So uh, I think anybody that bought the set wouldn't be super disappointed. A uh, next one is another indie that's uh, just got a release. Uh, Giles reviewed this on the site, so I'm going to let Giles uh, discuss or introduce it real quick. Yeah, this was uh, this was a fun thing. The the conceit here is you got a basically a sort of mumblecore kind of buddy comedy with one of the buddies being a an an ape. Um, it's a very obviously a guy in a you know costume, but it's sort of played straight as you know Silvio has no spoken lines, you know a few grunts. There are a number of dream sequences uh it's sort of is a little late on the shock tv commentary but then again shock tv commentary has been going on probably since i'm gonna guess the late 80s when shock tv started you know first rearing his head with uh you know certain cable programs but uh the fact that they you know sort of pulled off a a stunt like this while simultaneously being entertaining and also having some interesting dreamy and philosophical um interludes uh i think is a credit to the filmmakers behind this and it's you know it's it's a very easy watch it's a relaxing watch and you know it's ultimately you know pretty fun and uh, yeah i expand on this 
sort of uh, what's the word I'm like, uh, yeah relaxed tone to the whole thing in my interview which um not my interview my review and uh even finding something this you know quietly enjoyable is uh less common than i'd prefer uh you know even though i'm focusing on watching weird movies there's and so that's going to have its its own kind of baggage behind it um even in general from what i've seen it's like okay there's a it's a very low stakes game going on in there with you know him losing his job but you know it all sort of just meanders nicely to a finish point and uh i you know i was on the cusp of you know i'd say i'm on the cusp of really you know recommending this for certainly anyone who wants to see something a little different that uh won't freak you out i guess might be a way to quickly describe that okay any thoughts on that richard have you seen it by a chance i i haven't seen it you know i i saw the the clip um and uh yeah i mean uh, based on what the, what giles was just saying i mean i look forward to seeing it in the clip you know it's uh it's interesting the the, the deadpan performances the the very uh purposely flat lighting you know uh and I was looking at, you know, some of the, the the reactions that people had to it online, and it seems to just really open people's hearts. And uh, it's interesting to see something, you know, so, so flatly lit and so so deadpan in its presentation. I'm very curious as to what what that magic is, you know, that that really um, uh, charms people. And uh, I think I get a sense of it, you know, just just listening to to what, what Giles had to say. And, and so I look forward to seeing it. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. Yeah, heartwarming is the word I was looking for. And I, I don't look for that, but uh, I was happy to find it in this movie. I will say that we've done a uh, interview with the, uh, I did an interview with the directors of this, the team that directed it, but it was about uh, their other movie, Strawberry Mansion, uh, which came out recently. And we, I hadn't seen Silvio. We did mention just, they mentioned that it was going to be, it had found a home or they hinted that it had found a home as Music Box Films, uh, who's really stepped up to the plate and uh, taken on a lot of strange and uh, uh, films uh, lately, and they're doing good work. Uh, but let's move on. Okay, this one. This is as like I haven't seen it. I've seen the trailer. It's just the concept of the film that is really strange. I'm sure it's a weird movie based on the trailer, based on the director, and based on the premise. So the premise is basically that uh, there was this movie called Uncle Kent, which was a real mumblecore movie by Joe Swanberg. I think I saw it and uh, found it, you know, rather boring. It was it was mostly improvised, uh, and basically not many people saw it at all. But uh, that's kind of the conceit here: is they're remaking or they're doing a sequel to this movie, uh, this uh, improvised mumblecore. Uh, drama as sort of a wild, surreal comedy about the apocalypse with the same character, but just completely different style. It's done by Todd Rohall, who has a very odd sense of humor, uh, one that I haven't always uh, taken to. Uh, but I, again, just the whole idea of doing a sequel uh, to a movie that basically no one saw in a style <laughs> that's completely different uh, is just really intriguing. <clears throat> so, uh, guys, what do you think? Uh, I actually actually uh, accidentally only read up on the first Uncle Kent, and so thought that was uh, what was coming up here, and was sort of surprised we were going to devote our uh, you know some moments from our precious half hour to it. So. Uh, that said, uh, I am that much more intrigued by Uncle Kent, too, because yeah, the only trailer for Uncle Kent I found was in um, a group of that and four other uh, mumblecore films that kind of came and went from the film festival circuit. And so uh, I I'm always happy to see this kind of conceit uh, acted out. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking possibly in the vein of uh, the disaster artist about the creation of The Room um is uh vastly superior to the in many ways to the source material so uh now that you bring up what this is i actually am interested in seeing it okay i've seen this i've seen this movie um number two and, uh, or number one 
Uh, oh, number well. two, the the second one, I hadn't seen the the, the first one, and uh, yeah, uh, Kent going to a a a cosplay, you know, convention. He himself is a, I forget an, an animator or a, a a game designer. He's he's got some uh, skin in the game that makes him a, a bit of a celebrity. So he goes to this cosplay uh, event, and it's interesting to see all the people in the different costumes. And a very interesting uh conceit for a low budget filmmaker like myself is like to use this cosplay where everyone's in costume anyway and imagine something of an apocalyptic or sci-fi uh situation everyone's already in costume and you can sort of sort of play around with that but there's a crazy credits movie uh at, at the beginning of the movie where um it says that the first 11 or so minutes of this film were directed by uh joe swanberg and indeed, those first 11 minutes are, are Uncle, the Uncle Kent character and Joe Swanberg as himself sort of texting back and forth about making this sequel. And uh, I suppose the joke is that Swanberg is is quite um, happy in his private life and the way that his film career is going and isn't quite uh, as attentive to the sequel as, uh, as as the Uncle Kent character wants to be. And it's a, a strange sort of beginning to the film. And once that bit is over, you know, then, then it starts into, into to resembling the, the, the movie that you were describing. <laughs> yeah, the, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, these guys are clearly, I think, just, just playing around and having fun uh, and making a movie, uh, you know, for themselves, kind of wry and, and self-aware of what they're doing. It just sounds like it's going to be a fun little movie to see. Um, let's do this last one, though, really quickly, because it's Young Sherlock Holmes, which I reviewed back in the early days. Not really a weird movie. I'm only mentioning it because it's already on the site. Um, it is a fantasy. It was you know, somewhat famous as one of the first movies to use CGI. There's a nice scene of a, of a stained glass knight coming off a window, and then he comes alive and fights. Um, it, it's really not up in our genre. I just wanted to mention it because it is a cult movie. Uh, some people are uh, into it, and it is out from Paramount on Blu-ray for the first time. So that's just basically a notice uh, to you guys that this is out if people are into it. And if you guys have comments on that, you can go ahead and share them. Uh, nothing particular to say. I saw it when I was young. Thought it was neat. Uh, haven't seen it since. It's a Barry Levinson film, which is an interesting detail to me. Um, uh, that's quite a quite a career. Um, and this is an interesting movie within that career. It's uh, uh, not like anything else that he was doing. Okay. Well, that takes us through the uh, new releases. So. Uh... Now we can actually move on to talking to Richard. Uh, first off, uh, uh, I have to say, Richard, that your uh, your hair reminds me of David Lynch's <laughs> nice hair, and it's swept back kind of in the same way that Lynch does. So uh, I like it. Thank you very much. I wish we could go on with more similarities, but it <laughs> might unfortunately uh, end at that. That's where it ends. Okay, and uh, uh, you are in. Uh, are you in Dallas, Texas? I am, where it's rightly cold right now. Huh. What's going for Dallas? Well, no, it's been below freezing. There's there's hard ice on the ground, which is quite unusual for us. Um, so uh, businesses have been closed down, schools have been closed down. It's been treacherous to walk and to drive, and so it's uh, it's very cold. Now it's going to be back up into the 60s here in just a couple of days uh, as things go in Dallas. But right now, it looks pretty brutal outdoors. Mm. I lived in Dallas for a while and we one year we had an ice storm and it, yeah, everything shuts down when there's mm -hmm. ice. And so it's worse than snow for sure. Yeah. Um, but so what I was wondering is, is what is it like to make movies in, in Dallas area? Do, are there a lot of resources to lean on? I think so. I think it's a terrific place to make movies, especially uh, um, modestly budgeted uh, movies. Um, Mostly the the industry around here is is in industrial films and and commercial uh, production, but uh, I have recourse to terrific actors. There is um, edgy and inventive live theater that goes on uh, here in the city, and it's a pleasure to to talk with these actors and in, in some cases to work with them on film. 
Uh, they've been very hospitable to working uh, on these on these movies. And uh, I'm just the beneficiary of some some pretty terrific performances because of that. The surrounding areas of Dallas are, are also fascinating. Corsicana, which is uh, not too far from 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 Dallas, it's about a less than an hour drive south, um, is a, a place that is really becoming uh, open to motion picture uh, shooting in, in a variety of forms. They've been very welcoming to me. They have a very old looking uh, town square. Uh, there are uh, theater spaces there um, with uh, with costuming and things like that. That town uh, has been very, very welcoming to me. Uh, and really the quality of light that falls in North Texas is perhaps for me the chief feature. A lot of the movies that are set in Dallas or set in Texas are actually shot somewhere else. Um, but I think that that uh, does a disservice you know, perhaps to the filmmakers and to the product itself because the light that falls in North Texas, it's, it's, it's got its own quality. Um, it is a real pleasure to to shoot here in natural light. Um, I am asked, I guess, most often, you know, by festival programmers or something, is where did you shoot this? I mean, what what you know, what 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 time of day? And it's like, well, I just, you know, uh, have, have been able to have been reading the light here for for such a long time, and you can schedule your your particular scenes for a particular time of day, and it doesn't matter so much what you have uh, in terms of production design. Uh, the when the light looks terrific on everything, you can. You know, you can get a, a a lot of production volume. And now that I think about it, I, I saw your first film and, and a lot of scenes from the second one. Um, it seems like you, you do, do you shoot outdoors a lot on purpose mm -hmm. or to capture that Texas landscape? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah, the, the landscape, the features in the landscape, you can go just outside of Dallas, about 30 minutes outside of Dallas, and it becomes a whole different world, a very rural world. And uh, for me, in my films, I find it necessary to uh, use a lot of features of the natural world as, as correlatives for the emotions of the characters. You can do these sort of surprising cutaways or montages that feature the natural world, the way that sunlight uh, falls through the trees or uh, uh, the movement of water, the passing of clouds, or, or any number of things. There are so many uh, wonderful features within the landscape that I think match, uh, in some cases, the the, the crises or the, uh, the the ponderousness or the uh, just sort of describes, uh, illustrates, if you will, how a character might be uh, working through a problem. Um, and I think it just gives that extra bit of it. You know, it, it provides a surprise and and something that is also. Uh, hopefully seeming like an inevitability. And so instead of like having a character contemplating something and then cutting away uh, to a feature of the world, to, of, of the natural world, hopefully it seems more like an inevitability. You know, ah, yes, this matches within that mood as opposed to just cutting away from one character and, and, and showing a, a grass move through, moving through an empty field, you know, next. So uh, I would say that, you know, your movies to me have sort of a um, contemplative is a word you used about the characters, uh, poetic, um, philosophical, maybe uh, touch to them. And uh, I think that gives it sort of an obliqueness uh, that, that makes it seem weird. What was your background before filmmaking? Well, when I was 19, I was a, a DJ at a, at a country music radio station. And that was my first, I didn't really want to be a radio personality, but I was very fascinated by radio, what language could do, you know, to uh, to create a mental scene. And uh, I really wanted to follow radio and make, uh, eventually go into making radio shows, you know, uh, original dramas. Uh, that's about the time that that third channel at the time, now I think it's iHeartRadio, uh, started buying up uh, all the smaller market stations and it became more of a, a corporate endeavor. So the idea of using uh, a small small market radio station as a regional theater, you know, sort of fell away. And uh, eventually I found my way into writing plays, poetry, and and then into into film. But really for me, the I think what I think what eventually led me to to um working in film is something that I read at an impressionable age, a bit of criticism by uh, Edgar Allan Poe, in which he was talking about the uh, the suggestive and the undefined uh, in writing, the suggestive um, having to do with 
the uh, real world aspects of writing, um, features of, of land, uh, the body, things that you might suggest of the real world, and the undefined having to do with the spiritual aspects of, of writing, the, um, uh, those, those vague places just beyond the, the comprehension of our, of our senses that we know are there that we just can't necessarily articulate. And the point of his essay or the point of his bit of criticism about that was um, ways in which you could work with the suggestive and the uh, undefined as a way of making a language that works rather like a spell, a language, a, 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 you know, spell, a, a spell of language um, to give you a certain effect, a certain atmosphere. So it didn't have to have a specific sort of meaning, but that atmosphere was, was, was meaning enough. And I've just followed that way of thinking, you know, into movies. Um, what I was talking about a moment ago, you know, matching um, a, a character reckoning with something that's a, that's a, an enormity, you know, and then uh, a feature from the natural world, uh, to me, just goes back to that uh, idea that that Poe was getting at. It's not that I'm trying to emulate Poe or trying to make uh, <laughs> Poe-like movies in any way, but I am fascinated by that balance or that playful imbalance between the suggestive you know, and, and the undefined. And so I've really just, in any iteration of, of, of my uh, various sorts of careers, it's always been following that, uh, that, that muse that, that Poe let loose in, in that essay. I, that makes sense. And I can see that's the contemplative, poetic, uh, uh, philosophical thing. Now, uh, we are running out of time, but I did, so I've got to let you have a chance to talk about your upcoming movie, which, uh, uh, give us some uh, idea how it's going to be. I, is it in post production? How is it going to be released? Film festival? Yeah, it's it's complete. Uh, this coming Tuesday, I'm going to show it uh, to the the cast and some friends. Uh, we're going to gather at the historic Texas Theater here in Dallas, and it's going to be a really good time. Uh, we had a wonderful time shooting it. I've got a really good feeling about it. I'm proud of it. It's called The Dark Sisters. Uh, two sisters um, have been separated for a time owing to a dark secret from their past. It has divided them. Uh, they have come to a vacation out in the woods uh, to sort of reconcile, uh, to see what they can do to uh, uh, come back together again. But there are forces in these woods, uh, as there often are, uh, that uh, sort of conspire against them, or at least you know, come between them. These forces uh, have embodiments. One, there is a thief, and uh, there is also a hunter, the thief character. She is uh, in need of redemption. Uh, the hunter is a powerful character who can offer her that redemption. Big question, does that redemption for the thief come at the expense of the two sisters? And might that uh, consequence have something to do with some comeuppance for the, for the sisters and uh, that dark secret that they possess? I, I man, that, uh, that's a lot. I am actually kind of <laughs> sorry that uh, I was a little worried and I'm actually kind of <clears throat> sorry that we had so many movies to cover, although I think they were fun and you uh, added some. I would have liked to talk to you more about uh, your movies, uh, but we are so, we are limited on time and we're running out of time. And so we're going to we're going to do something, something more with you, Richard, and uh, maybe bring you back another day or get you something written. Uh, but uh, since we're running out of time, I'm going to sign off for me and Giles. And thank you very much for being here. Richard Bailey movie is The Dark Sisters. Thank you so much. Good to meet thank you, Richard. You. We are out.